are so delighted to have today the designer of all of those buildings, Santiago Calatrava. So Santiago is with no doubt one of the most famous architects globally. He's the brains behind so many iconic buildings. More locally, he's the brains behind the Dubai Creek Tower. I know there are many towers in Dubai, <laughs> but this one is meant to be the tallest building in the world. He's also the designer of the National Pavilion of the UAE, the, the Expo 2020 building. That is meant to uh, probably more than 25 million visitors are gonna be there. So actually, Mikael is his son, and he's the one running all of the operations here in Dubai. So please Pleasure. join me in welcoming also Mikael. two buildings, the Dubai Creek Tower and the Pavilion of the Expo 2020. But I think the only way to really understand the scope of his work is to see that. Thank you again for being here with us. For me, it's a particular pleasure because I'm Spanish and I was actually living in Valencia where I had the opportunity to observe all of his art. So thank you again, Santiago. How we would like to start this conversation is actually getting to know you a little bit better. So your first steps in your career, something in particular that you want to mention, your driving license or something. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, well, you, because you spoke uh, about uh, Valencia, uh, but first of all, let me uh, tell all of you how, mu how much I admire the work you are doing worldwide. And uh, uh, just uh, um, three minutes ago, we was speaking about uh, YouTube. Uh, and what an extraordinary way, you know, to reach uh, uh, things like, for example, Shostakovich. We hear now the valves of the sweet jazz. And uh, Wittgenstein, Mahler, whatever, it's, it's extraordinary, it's really extraordinary. And what a high level, what a high level, just to mention. So I think uh, it's really uh, very uh, uh, stimulating to be here. And it is for me and Michael a uh, great honor to speak to you. Mm, now, coming back to your question, you see, I was born in Valencia. And uh, I think I was uh, lucky to be born in, a, uh, in, in circumstances where um, um, art was appreciated. So people who will learn you, you can be also an artist, you know. And an artist is eventually, if you reach the level of Velázquez or Picasso, is something important. Yes. It is something that... Um, uh, so uh, when you are a kid, then you... Uh, I was sent it with uh, eight, uh, uh, apparently because I was drawing the whole time to the uh, uh, school for arts and craft, who was in the neighborhood. So I could go during two years until they moved me into another school who was uh, uh, 
very serious and very hard, and so I couldn't dedicate uh, more, more of my time uh, to the uh, drawing, just studying. And then uh, finally I decided to go back to the art school, so I went to Paris and at the Col de Beaux-Arts. And then what it happens it is I chose the wrong year. It was 68, you know, for many of you. <laughs> the school was destroyed when I arrived there. And then so I went back and I started again in the art school in Valencia, but I changed my mind, you know. I say, well, I got, I am coming out of six years of mathematics and all these things, so let's go and choose something that uh, permits me to, to, to draw, and I was already considering architecture as a very artistic profession, but also I can uh, go through mathematics and uh, all of that, so I entered in the Polytechnic in Valencia, where you also help me to study. And then once I finished the Polytechnic, I was too lazy to start working, so I decided uh, I should go and continue studying, so I moved into Switzerland, with which I was familiar because my mother sent me very, I, I think I was 13 years old, to learn French with a family of, uh, originally from Geneva. And uh, um, so I went to Zurich without uh, very little knowledge of uh, German. I could say Guten Tag or things like that. <laughs> and I studied, I entered in the Polytechnic, I studied civil engineer, and after eight years in the Polytechnic, was for me a transcendental uh, seven to eight years in the Polytechnic, uh, I finished with a a doctorate in, in more in a, in, in a part of geometries and so and then after that I started working this was a little bit the background of, of my career uh, um, which was your first project my first project was uh, uh, so I uh, I married when I was a student my wife I see my wife studied law in Zurich and uh, we was both students married and uh, I finished um, uh, one year before my wife, and so I opened an office uh, uh, without almost no work. And the first client became my, my colleague, the, the architect, who maybe they wanted to, they, they have had a balcony to do, a canopy to do, uh, uh, a post shelter to do, uh, and things like that. And with the, uh, I cooperated with them, uh, given the fact that I was an engineer, and also I could do, started doing some design. And I went over into uh, doing the facades of uh, always with colleagues, indeed. So I spent three, four years uh, uh, working uh, sometimes alone, but mostly with others, which it was a good introduction because I could learn a lot of their experience. Indeed. And also I started working in subjects that uh, they was not uh, too big and uh, I could manage them, you see, in it uh, as a holistic uh, st uh, story, you see, so, uh, which it is very important, because finally I learned that it is as difficult to design a chair as a, it is uh, maybe a very large building. It is important that the scale uh, doesn't play a role in terms of seeking for originality, innovation or perfection. We were talking about this timing, so how is the creative process? Do you start with something simple like a sketch or do you get your motivation from YouTube? Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, look, you see, I, I, uh, I mean, at the, in this moment, the computer was already there when I started. And indeed, I worked uh, once uh, in, a, in a project at the school, of, uh, 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 a research project, with a machine from a company called Evans and Sutherland, who do still today fly simulators, and it was the first step in computer aid design, you know, where you, you, I'm networking with two other programmers, you see, and then they say, I want to do a square, and then I could run a square in the screen, then another one, and extrude it, you see, and then turn it, and things like a very simple thing, until we design, uh, we have done in 3D without hidden line, you see, we saw all the line. Uh, we put the houses of a village of Ticino, you know, very simple houses, you see, with roof like that, a bell tower, things like that. It was very interesting, but it was also a very interesting experience for me because it opened my mind to the fact what is from the mind to the paper. And the, even today, for me, the most direct way is the heart. So I keep uh, still today sketching in the beginning of a project. Sketching as I have done when I was a kid and sketching as I have done when I 
started as an architect and as an engineer. So still today, I think that this chemistry, you see this internal chemistry of bringing things just with uh, even the force of the gesture uh, and all of that, you see, I think it is, uh, so I started effectively with, uh, with uh, my drawing. We've been actually like a couple of minutes ago talking about the influence of, of technology in the creative process and you were mentioning that it's something that it will never change, that the, still you have to feel the, the sound, how does it sound when you are in the station and how does it sound the, the city. So thank you for sharing with us this information. So talking about the type of designs, many of your designs are bridges. Not the typical bridges that we see in the railway, but those beautiful bridges, like for example this one. What motivates you about designing yeah. bridges? Yeah. Uh, you see, to, to say it in a very short manner, uh, I mean, historically, if you go to cities like Paris, London, Rome, or even Valencia, my home, a town that has five stone bridges, um, you see, uh, bridges signify through the uh, history uh, uh, very important buildings, you know, very important gestures in the middle of landscapes, in the middle of cities, and all of that. Then, uh, when I came out of school, bridges was very utilitarian oriented. Even our formation in the school, very much, you know, let's say, uh, mm, 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 let's say, cost function related. And I asked me why this happened. And I arrived to the following conclusion: it is that in the post-war time, after the Second World War, practically all the bridges in Europe were destroyed, all the important bridges, and they needed to be uh, rebuilt in a very sharp manner. After that, in the 50s. There was a, an explosion of highways and, and so during the 50s and 60s, and a whole culture of very simple bridges, you see, of, uh, of support beams, support beams, and so on, so without any other cave that bringing cars from one side to another, bringing people from one, uh, one side to another. So in this uh, uh, contrast, I tell me, there is something um, lost here. It is as we will not appreciate let's say museums, or we will not appreciate churches, or something like that, so the cathedral will not be there, isn't it? So finally, I uh, uh, started working with the pure vocabulary of engineering, which it is the statical system, arcs, um, uh, mast, cables, uh, beams, uh, bow girders, and things like that, not changing very much the vocabulary by itself, but just trying to combine uh, uh, those elements in a way that they can landmark the place. And this was finally the, the reason why I started working. Mm, like not only bridges, but also related to public work. You've done a lot of transportation hubs, like yeah. for example, railway station. What do you think is the influence of the transportation hubs into the city? For example, this one. Yeah, you know, uh, this is also, uh, uh, you can imagine, you see, I say I started in Switzerland and uh, very little the connections, even today, you see, it's not that time. I'm not, uh, mm, let's say, very social related person. I dedicate a major part of my time to, to work. Uh, uh, and so the only source of work I, I got was doing competitions. I have done more than 100, and I think the last one was the 145 competitions. So competitions are all organized by public agents, uh, uh, rarely by private or corporations, things like that. And so I. I started getting involved naturally, you know, in thinking about railway station. So the, the first major competition I won was a railway station in Zurich, Stadelhof. And this introduced me into the world of the public transportation and the public works, which I think is a very uh, gratifying work, because as the name say, they are public, they are addressed to everybody. You, uh, you, you, I mean, you have a client in front of you, which it is, uh, you know, the, let's say the railway authority, railways authority, but um, finally you are working uh, for an abstract uh, uh, person, which it is, uh, let's say, the community or, or the city or the, or the travelers. That is the reason why I enter in this field. And, you know, I have a link, uh, uh, an important link uh, to that. I think also it legitimates a little bit fact of trying to do something special for everybody, it legitimates the world. So we've been talking about bridges, transportation hubs as a single structure into the city, but you've done also urban redevelopment projects, like for example the one in Valencia, 
where you have to not only think about the structure, but what do you want to have around like all of those buildings? How do you want the people to have the experience around all of this city? So what's your vision and your goal with all of these type of projects? Well, uh, let's take the project of Valencia. You see uh, as a uh, particular project. Because, uh, because uh, I'm used to this project because I used to walk every day, so I'm like, really familiar with uh, this uh, one. You see, what, uh, it's, it's interesting uh, in, in uh, that because <coughs> so the, 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 in my opinion, the uh, original idea was the idea of the client, the, the authority who decide to do <coughs> a cultural project, cultural oriented project in the poorest area of the city. Very rare, you know, mostly you will do an opera in the center of the city or you will do a museum where, uh, the, uh, no, they decide to do that in the area between the city and the harbor, a kind of no man's land, you see, where it was very, very depressed. Believe me, I don't want to describe it, but it was also very polluated physically and also from the point of view of the human uh, uh, relations in this area was very depressed. Indeed. So <clears throat> they decide to in initiate, and, and I, I went into a competition, uh, mm, uh, the idea of doing a city of the art and communication at the time. It was art, uh, no, no, it was uh, science and communication. This was the first move. Then you see the, the mobile telephones came and Telefonica as an investor set, uh, set back. You see, they say, we are not more interested in financing a very tall tower for communication. We wanted to do as a kind of icon. So we changed that into the city of the arts and science, and then it became the, the tower and the, the foundations of the tower. We built an opera who justified this kind of delivering uh, uh, shape because it supported in the triangle of the tower since the foundation was already done. Okay. So, a remarkable story how you have to adapt yourself and be still creative, you know, uh, by getting. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the fact is, you see, that uh, what did happen it is in 30 years' time, you know, less than 30 years, the area changed completely. Com completely. I mean, not uh, 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 in the character of the area, became a very livable area. And then also, uh, let's say, private promoters came, you know, avenues was uh, uh, done, Avenida de Francia, another street, so that today the city is linked with the harbor and this side. Still, there is a lot to do. But it has become a kind of uh, uh, important local icon, uh, 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 um, icon, and uh, eventually the best uh, compliment I hear about this is, somebody say me, I have a young son, Anytime somebody comes from abroad, he wants to show him the city of the art and science. And this is what finally shows you uh, the real reality. It is the, 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 the new generation, you know, they take it as their own and they are proud about it. And this is what you can achieve, you know, by uh, sometimes landmarking places, you see, with, I mean. Uh, I have to add something to this. It's actually the first thing you do in Valencia. Take someone to the Ciudad de las Artes y las Ciencias. So thank you. Talking about more, like, this is based in Europe, so talking about your experience, you have a global experience, but talking about more about your experience in the Middle East, uh, how, do you, how does it feel to work in the Middle East, and if you have any particular experience that you would like to share with us? Yes, well, the, the, my experience in the Middle East is very much uh, um, done together uh, with uh, uh, my son Michael, and uh, in this case I want to say you spoke about a global experience, and I say before, also my mother sent me when I was 13, going to 14, uh, to learn French with this family from Geneva. And uh, um, if I look back, this changed my life. So I tried to uh, implement that also with my own family. So I send my kids uh, also abroad. Uh, I think it's uh, I think it's a loud sir to say if you love your your child, send it away. They got uh, really. They got a real exposure. Uh, we we moved from Zurich to Paris, so they they was involved. I mean, they went there in the primary school. I mean, in the case of Michael. Then I sent them to to Windsor in England. Then I sent them to Spain. They spent two years in Spain. But to Spain. add to that, he sent me away when I was very young and then but he was the one who asked me to come back and join him and for two months I said no then each one of them you see decide to learn also a special language so the eldest one 
uh, when uh, we, we saw a movie called The Hand of the Red October, and coming yeah. out, he said to me, I would like to learn Russian. So I sent well, him to Moscow, St. Petersburg, and so forth. <laughs> and uh, in the case of uh, Gabriel, uh, he wanted to learn Chinese. So uh, uh, we, uh, also very young, uh, I sent him to, uh, to Singapore, and then to Taiwan, and then finally to Beijing. And in his case, uh, he said to me uh, prudently, I want to perfection the languages I know. <laughs> <laughs> so he went to Italy, went to Sweden, uh, and so. Oh, and then when he was 16, he came me, so. to the idea, he said, I would like to learn Arabic. And uh, then I said, That was the only left. Yeah, Someone yeah. told you Russian, no, Chinese, yeah, exactly. they already know English, Spanish. Looking. So I sent, uh, 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 or he was sent to. to, to, to to Kuwait, to the Spanish ambassador, because I didn't know. No, first to Syria, to the house of a doctor, a doctor who studied with my brother in uh, the medicine faculty in Valencia. We was uh, good related to him, and then uh, then uh, he went to to Kuwait, to Qatar, to Dubai, and and to uh, also going to Cairo. Uh, uh, so he was familiar, and I think that is very important. He was familiar. Uh, with this part of it. Once I got involved in the project of the Doha Bay crossing, uh, I thought Michael uh, could help me. I asked him and he said what he says. Before he was working in the finance, he studied engineering and uh, um, study after that, I make an MBA and was working in the finance. Uh, and he said, no. And then after a while, I convinced him to, to join me and he moves to Qatar, open an office there. And he is now uh, in this part of the world in Dubai with an office also here, and uh, since six and a half, almost seven years. How do you coordinate the projects with Michael? Do you argue from time to time or not? <laughs> no, you know what did happen. Michael, uh, 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 let's say, uh, uh, he, he is here, base is completely autonomous, and uh, uh, which it is. I mean, it's completely autonomous. He does whatever he wants. He hires with the persons he wants. He, he organizes the office in his own manner. And, uh, and uh, indeed, I am following him. You know, it's he who tells me what I have to do. <laughs> 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 Which is, is very comfortable, I have to yeah. <laughs> Talking about the project in Middle East, so we mentioned at the beginning the Dubai Creek Tower, and as well the pavilion of the Expo 2020. Could you please, maybe you, Michael, give us more details about the pavilion or from where did you get the inspiration from and how the pavilion is going to be used after the Expo 2020? A lot sure. of questions in one, by the way. <laughs> sure. Um, maybe he could speak about the design first and the, the influence. But from the brief, um, the pavilion being a pavilion, um, one of the things that we wanted to reflect was um, the, the country and, and the people of the country um, and what you'll notice in the picture is there are many roads leading to the pavilion, and we wanted to make that reflective of this country, especially uh, the, with the likes of Emirates, DXB. Um, it's one of the largest uh, transportation and transit hubs. So for us, it was important to reflect these qualities of the country in the pavilion itself. So you can approach the country, for the, you can approach the pavilion from, from 360 degrees. Yes, there is a main entrance, a, you know, a ceremonial entrance, but the way you will see the, the pavilion, what, no matter from where you come, you will be able to enter and access the pavilion and be taken by underneath the wings and guided forward. Um, naturally, during the expo, entrance, egress and entrance needs to be somewhat controlled, um, but otherwise the idea is to have a very fluid building. Maybe he could speak a bit more about the influence. Yeah, well, you, you can imagine uh, it's a great honor for uh, all of us working in the pavilion to do this particular project. And why? Because uh, um, the United Arab Emirates are hosting the World Fair, and we are doing their nat national pavilion. Now, you see, the idea, sometimes it's good if you jump back, you see, into the past to understand what means this reg region today. Uh, and for eventually, uh, uh, many of you is, are familiar with a place called Petra, Petra is a, a, a world heritage place. It's an extraordinary place. You can go and admire uh, architecture, but also studying, they was an enormous city. It was an enormous city, very wealthy, very prosperous. It was in the, in the 
crossing point of many caravans, you know, coming from east, from west, and so, and uh, a very important commercial hub and cultural hub, in, in surrounded by the Roman Empire. So, I mean, it's a little bit, in a way, this, this is what Dubai is today. You understand, you have Russia, you have China, you have India, you have the United States, you have Europe, and here is this tiny place, you know, who is uh, uh, showing to the world that you can do extraordinary things, isn't it? We want also to deliver this feeling. It's not, we are not looking back as much as we are looking forward. You understand? We are doing something you, you saw before the roof move open. They are uh, the, the, the solar energy cover. You understand? Very, very progressive. And on the other side, uh, built here mm. with local technologies. You see the carbon fiber fabricated here, and so the steel is also fabricated here. We are working with local contractors, which it is a very, so, I mean, uh, in a way, you see, uh, this uh, is interesting to think on Petra, you know, just because I admire it enormously much. You know, it's uh, some, uh, one of those places where I think it's a must, you know, once in a life to go there and see the extraordinary, how they could do in this special enclave, you know, this extraordinary culture and those, these fantastic buildings. And I think uh, uh, the phenomena is repeated here, in a way, just over uh, 1,900, 1,800 years later, you know, you have one of the points of the, the culture and civilization today uh, here. You see in the crossroads also uh, uh, flyways, in this case, are important of, that, of the world. You see, so it's very, it's very interesting and very stimulating looking it from this perspective. Who, in my opinion, gives you a sense of this extraordinary phenomena, which it is Dubai and the United Arab Emirates in the world today. How would you like this building to be used after the Expo 2020? Like, for example, if you think about the Eiffel Tower, was built for one of the expos. How do you think this building is going to be used after? Well, the Eiffel Tower passed better to our uh, Greek Harvard <laughs> Tower. I know it's, you know, the example. Because in this case, you see, uh, what it happens is, uh, certainly, you see, because, as Michael described, it's a very open building, isn't it? It's very... Uh, uh, so, finally, you see, um, they are, uh, uh, is, it will be easy to transform the use, isn't it? In eventually, mm. I don't know, you know, the client will decide it. It's also a very neutral building. It's not a building, you see, with a lot of partition and a very, uh, you understand, it's, it's very open. You know, there are three levels. There is a central element inside, you see, a kind of core. So it follows archetypical, so-called archetypical shape. It's very important, you see. And the speed of the progress, you see, architecture moves very often through very, uh, I mean, very clear and precise schemes, you see, called archetypical schemes. You can see that uh, in, in, in the mosques, you see, for example, uh, if you look at uh, how important it is in, in uh, Istanbul, for example, Hagia Sophia, who is a Christian temple, you see, towards the rest of the mosque, done by this extraordinary architect, Sinan, you see, with the, the, the Blue Mosque, the uh, Suleiman Mosque, and all of that, who follows almost the same architect, uh, archetypical plan. Or the, uh, you see it also, I mean, just to open your mind about that, and the speed of the progress, architecture has patterns of behavior who are very simple. You understand? So happens also by the railway station. They follow the, the pattern of the, of the tracks, you see, and each one of them is different. Although the program, you see, is practically the same because they are archetypical elements. And in this case, we, we chose a very simple, uh, is a, a, a very, you know, a, a building which is completely open in all the directions. I mean, completely accessible, accessibility, and then has internal, a very clear and simple structure. Yeah. I think also one thing to point out, um, the client, the National Media Council and, and the general body of, of the UAE, um, have gone to great lengths to ensure the continuity of the buildings themselves and also know that Expo has gone to great lengths. So there are intended future uses for the building, um, be the exhibition halls, etc. And we've dealt, we, one of the things that we did um, a lot with the client was really understand how to convert this building from its Expo use to the future use. Um, there's one thing that has been at the forefront of the design of the interiors of the building um, in order to ensure the continuity of the building. Focusing more in the Dubai Creek Tower, I, the tallest building in the world again, from where did you get the inspiration from this tower and what's the vision of the client? Can I just say something? You it's, can add them, yeah. It's, 
it is planned to be well, it, it's planned to be taller than the current record holder. Okay. I think saying it's <laughs> the tallest building in the world, we'll see when we get there. Yes, it, 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 it's, it's going to be taller than Burj Khalifa. It's going to be taller than Burj Khalifa, say, yeah. <laughs> one has to be very specific with the wording. We will have a nice view from Burj <laughs> yeah. Khalifa, yeah. We will change the, the words in the future, but now it's meant to be the tallest. Sure. <laughs> I just don't want to get into trouble. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's been, it's been recorded, yes, so whatever I, I we know want to change, recorded. we can do it later. <laughs> so, from where did you get the inspiration of this tower? Well, do you see, um, I mean, in, 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 uh, uh, there are two aspects of the inspiration. One is, let's say, let's say the virtual fact of doing an extraordinary building. The inspiration came from the client. I have a question. It was actually yeah, the, in the, the brief. The client was asking yeah. for a very special and extraordinary thing. In the brief received. Uh, even he, uh, all the people competing in the was yes. called by the client, and we have had a conversation with him uh, uh, at the phone, and I remember the enormous enthusiasm that uh, the, the head of MR, Mr. Alabar, was uh, putting in his work. You see, the idea of doing an extraordinary painting uh, let's say, to overcome uh, 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 barriers and frontiers in order to do an icon, a new icon uh, for Dubai, who is already landmarked by Burj Khalifa, Burj Khalifa in such an extraordinary manner. You see, the silhouette of Burj Khalifa is, uh, 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 I mean, is uh, unmistakable. And mm, what, uh, mm, so that saying, you know, the, uh, uh, a lot of the language of, uh, that we are using here comes from the experience in bridges. If you look, some of my bridges, you know, they have masts, and some of them, they have cables. And so I thought that the easiest way, using modern technology, to achieve uh, the, the, the high uh, we, could, uh, we could maybe try to achieve uh, is by using pure engineering technology. So it's like uh, you, you mentioned before, La Tour Eiffel. Eh? Tour Eiffel is also a pure engineering thought. It's responding to the forces coming out of the wind. So the wind is pushing, and then you get so-called bending moments, you see, and the bending moments are, uh, are growing exponentially towards the basis. Eh? And, uh, and because of that, the basis also became larger. You see? So it's a very simple, but a very significant idea who, uh, who uh, is also very natural. It's also like, like the basis of a tree. You see, it's also wider and uh, powerful, and then it goes thinner and thinner going up. And the same thing happens also in our tower. Uh, the only thing it is, in order to spread those forces very far apart, we use cables. And uh, uh, this is a little bit the resonement. It's not, uh, um, but uh, I underline so much the enthusiasm of uh, my client. Because I believe there is not a great building in the world without a great client, whatever. Because you see, the, I mean, in a way, the rule of an architect, that is also, uh, I want to just make a, uh, you see, I, I see my own uh, work a, a little bit like following the so-called, you see, since YouTube, it can go so high in the level, I want also to rise up the, <laughs> as much as I can the level of this conversation. It is the Socratic method. And Socrates, used to say, I do like my mother. The mother of Socrates was called Sophrona, and she was a midwife. So she helped kids come to the world. So indeed, pregnant with the project is somebody else. And the only thing you, you do is help him to, that, that this project becomes a reality. Do you understand? So it's very important to get vibration, you know, coming out of the person who is getting to you or the place where the thing, where this thing needs to be done. So to build in Dubai is not a joke, because we are confronted to the other icons here. Do you understand? To build here and to be here as an architect or an engineer is a real challenge. You understand? You can do that very easy. But if you really take the challenge, I tell you, it's one of the most challenging places in the world today to do something, just because you are confronted to those facts you see of our time. And so finally, uh, uh, I think all this uh, of the of this conjunction, you know, we came with this project. You were mentioning the challenge. Is this one of the most challenged buildings or designs you have ever done? 
Do Maybe you, you can. For, from an engineering perspective, it's quite interesting um, dealing with the daily kind of problems that we're facing. Um, when you go tall, we we haven't invented tall buildings, and and surely somebody will go taller one day. Um, but what's very important is to note that from a challenge perspective, we're taking everything to, to, to the extreme of what is currently available. And we're challenging the industry as much as the industry is challenging us. Um, what's interesting is every, uh, everyday normal issues get amplified um, to the extreme in our building. And, and either it's really useful or really harmful, or not harmful, but works against you. For example, um, earthquake loads. Um, we're in a semi-seismic area here. And um, the earthquake vibrations have not so much of an impact to our building, because our normal frequencies of our building are very different to the frequencies of the earthquake. So much shallower buildings have a greater, suffer more greatly than, than we do in our building. So we can count that as a benefit. However, as you go up, the wind loads become exaggerated. See, in horizontal structure, you are fighting directly against gravity bridges because gravity wants to pull it down. In vertical structures, you're mostly fighting against wind loads. And so we find that um, our wind load calculations when we were do doing, because um, we have to follow codes and regulations, and at some point, some codes stop, and then they just start extrapolating. And they're like, well, for this height, this applies. So you just go higher, and you apply the same line. So we ended up applying at the top of our tower, we ended up applying wind loads that have never been recorded ever in the world anywhere. <laughs> so uh, we were like, all right, how do we, how do we design for this? Um, also, things like elevators. Um, you think of an elevator being, having been, in, you know, this, this safe elevator having been invented by Otis, etc. Um, we now are in the issue of the cable that carries the cab doesn't just weigh once, twice, or three times as heavy, is not just as heavy as the, as the cab itself. We're dealing with cables that are 20 times as heavy as the cab. And the length at which we are and the sway of the building causes... Um, if you calculate it, the cable to hit the side of the elevator shaft, either damaging the shaft or damaging the cable. So as you push these things to, to, to their maximum nowadays, uh, you encounter things that you would think are just rudimentary, let's install an elevator, let's install cables. All those simple things that we take for granted start becoming issues. So that's, those are the interesting parts. So we're dealing with the industry and in, in coming up with new ways and, and interacting with them and how to solve these problems. Related to those buildings, as, as you mentioned before, require the use of modern technology. How do you keep up with advancement in new technologies and new materials? Like now you are designing something that probably is going to be finished in X years. How do you keep up with all of the new materials and new things coming up? Sure. So, so there's, there's two aspects to this. Um, Number one is what is able to be sourced and delivered locally. And we have a grand benefit of, of in the UAE there being not just um, a wealth of materials and a high quality of materials. For example, in our uh, pavilion, the carbon fiber that we're using for the roof uh, is sourced across the street from the expo site. So that's, and we, we first, one of the first things we do is figure out what um, rudim, for basic technologies, i.e. concrete, steel, what is available locally, what is the construction industry most comfortable with. And so when we found out that there was carbon fiber in plenty and in an extremely high quality across the street, uh, we changed most of the design in order to fit that. Um, from a high technology perspective, again, the global industry knows that to work in the UAE is, is, is challenging in terms of technical achievements and technical advancements. So when the, the individuals, the contractors, the specialists come to deliver their product, we're really dealing with the, the absolute best of the best. And we're able to source globally those the, the, from each individual industry. So our conversation with the advancements in technology and the advancements in building materials 
is at the forefront and is a global conversation. And we, our job is to um, adapt our design, adapt our methods, adapt everything that we do in order to fit the, the, the kind of the, the top of that technology into our building and ensure that we're really building the most advanced building we can. So the conversation is two ways. Maybe I want to add, because I think uh, the question is also interesting, related to other, um, let's say, science, you know, computer science. Maybe. You see, uh, the way how the construction uh, uh, technology uh, moves is a bit different, although it has whatever and step is given, has an enormous transcendence. For example, getting from cast steel into, or cast iron, who is brickable, you know, to more ductile uh, structures, you see, like steel, moves into the high scrapers. You see, it's not a joke, you understand? You can immediately go much higher just by this change. Those changes happen, uh, let's say, um, from time to time, you know, it's like a, a bolting, a screwing, or welding, you see? Uh, this, um, you see, you see that eventually those very, very extreme situation you see much more today in the aerospatial industry or into a, in the uh, um, military industry, let's say. You understand? In the construction industry, moves much slower. That is one point. So it means, you know, that, that is important. When the people built Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, you see, around 1,700 years ago, it was like sending a man to Mars today. Do you understand what I mean? They was really, the architecture was really in the top of the, of, uh, and you know, they have done that in an extraordinary way, because at the speed of the earthquake, Hagia Sophia and the vault, so the vaults of Sinan are still there. Do you understand? So it is interesting to see, you know, that we, I mean, we in the construction industry, we are not in the point of the evolution. Do you understand what I mean? There are today other uh, aspects of the technology who are much more advanced, from which we can eventually take advantage. Do you understand? Uh, but it is important uh, to, to see it like that. And I think Mike, Michael described it very good because we are not using extraordinary techniques. We are just pushing the existing technique to a limit where they have not yet been. In terms of the length of the cable, the weight, the relation, and the movement, and so. And what it is also interesting it is that those uh, companies, you know, who are top companies worldwide, they are responding very positively. They are enthusiastic to go towards uh, this uh, new challenge, and it, which it, it, it means, you know, we are in a very fruitful uh, 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 field, and also that for for many companies, they see Dubai is a place to do this kind of thing. That is also important. So, so there, there are certain aspects of the building that, that we've, the tower that we've designed, that if you were to build it right this second, the, some of the solutions don't exist yet. They're still in R&D, they're still in testing. You also have to keep in mind that given that um, we're moving so many people, um, the, the guarantees and warranties that need to be in place need to be truly tested. And um, because we, we're dealing with human beings passing through a building, so we cannot have any failures. Um, that having been said, the conversations we're having with the industry and our job is to accommodate the introduction of that technology the second it becomes available into our building. So what we're doing is we're designing certain elements to be able to accommodate one, two, or three different, solu different iterations of a solution that we need. And so what happens is that spurs on the industry to really accelerate their R&D, knowing that they have somewhere to place it immediately once it's set. So it's a two-way conversation where we provide the platform and we provide the platform in such a way where it's a very easy integration and so the conversations start at the very beginning and are, are plentiful and very fruitful for us to be able to integrate some of these technologies immediately. Also with the latest concern about climate change and sustainability, how do you think architecture is going to help preserve all of those things into the cities? And especially, for example, this building. Did you take into consideration those things before designing that? Yes. So we can speak both about this. There's, there's mm -hmm. a few buildings. Uh, the pavilion building um, is lead platinum rated. It's an extremely green building. And that was one of the goals that was set from the onset by the client. Um, our job is to take um, 
the, the, the green uh, building idea and transform it into something that is extremely pleasant, um, visually stunning, it, for the visitor is something that is just breathtaking while still being extremely smart on the inside, uh, being extremely well insulated. And again, using the latest um, thermal insulation technologies, uh, using um, energy capturing systems, for example, um, the sea, the roof that is all closed now, it opens up to reveal uh, an entire array of photovoltaic cells. So we're incorporate, and when we have conversations with the industry that provides photovoltaic cells, we we scour the world to find the most efficient, um, the the most suitable for the building for the environment. So we go through months of of research and conversations with the specific technological industries to try to see where are we at in this technology, where are we going to be, how do we integrate this? Um, so that's from a very high level. Uh, these buildings that look like not look well the way they do are extremely smart when they get when it comes to green technologies. We're trying to our, our job as architects is in certain ways explain that the building is green, but not but have it done seamlessly. So when when you open Google or YouTube, you don't get shown two hours worth of explanation of how amazing the code is that is behind the thing. It's seamless. And the work is tremendous. Uh, we try to do the same. That having been said, there are many instances, especially when you're dealing with museums. Maybe we can show the Museum de Amanya in, in uh, Rio, where we integrate uh, ecological solutions into the architecture in a way that is very visible in order to educate the people. And those are very simple aspects. Um, this is one, the pools around the building here. This is in the Bay of Rio de Janeiro. And the pools around the, the building pump up um, water. First, the, the electricity they source in order to pump up the water is done with photovoltaic cells all, around, all along the ceiling. And then they pump up the water. And through natural small cascades that go from pool to pool, the water is cleaned and filtered in a very natural way by using the sand, local sand, that it, but makes the bottom of these pools. And then the filtration system allows for the water that is pumped up to then be returned to Rio de Janeiro in a much cleaner fashion. So that is a way that we explain to the individuals living there that the building is in self contributing, even if it's in a small way, a visually contributing to cleaning the bay. And so there are certain aspects, sometimes where you just need to hide the fact that you're extremely smart. And other times, or that the building is extremely smart, we just work hard. Um, and, and other times, show simple steps and, and really show that, that the idea of green buildings, green energy, is, is something that is attainable and achievable just by taking very small steps and not make it something overwhelming. You want to add something? Yeah, uh, just very short, you see. Uh, but just to um, uh, open your mind, uh, that um, architecture will remain a creation of the spirit. You see, that is very important. However, you see, uh, uh, as an architect, you can learn a lot from the nature. You see, you can learn from the shells. You can learn uh, from the insects, from the animals, from uh, from the trees, from the plants. And, and uh, this approach, you see, of um, uh, uh, addressing uh, to the nature, you see, as uh, your, uh, our mother and teacher, you see. So I, I started my uh, doctor thesis at the ETH, Natura Mater et Magistra, who means uh, nature, mother, and teacher. You see, even, you know, working, you know, in very geometrical patterns, you see, but I was relating me to the crystallography. You understand the way how crystals it is. I remember in the geo uh, geology uh, uh, lectures uh, at the poly in Zurich, you see that the, the teachers say, finally, if you look well, even mug is done under a microscope by crystal. So the whole world is a crystal. What a beautiful idea, isn't it? So the sense of perfection and mathematical uh, exactitude. So it opens you another point of view. You see, often the moments of flourishing architecture has been related to 
an enormous flourish, uh, flourishing of the exact sciences. You see, for example, when the Arabs, you know, at the Caliphate in Cordoba uh, uh, was in at the highest point when they built this extraordinary mosque with, uh, with the, um, uh, the mikvah, with the dome of the mikvah, extraordinary uh, works who has been influencing during centuries of their architects, there was the time of a guy called Algorithm and the invention of algebra, al algebra. They are all, you understand the, the, the discovering of the Sefer, the zero. You understand, I think it was a, an almost revolutionary changes in mathematics, you know. They reco uh, recopied uh, Euclides, Euclides, you see, they, 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 they make from geometry, you know, the basis of all their buildings, you know, thinking that the geometry is a link as Pythagoras has done, you know, there was also how religious guys, you know, was a relation between the, our, the existing universe and, and a celestial uh, idea, you know, the, the idea of a heaven. The same thing happens also in the middle of the Baroque, you know, where you have Borromini, Bernini, those extraordinary, Balthasar, Neumann, those extraordinary architects, you know, uh, Newton was uh, working and discovering together with Leibniz also the integral uh, calculation, you know, and then Leonard Euler and, and Fermi and, and uh, I mean, was an you, you see, it's often we have to see those things going hand in hand, although very far apart, you see, uh, and architecture has been from the beginning very attractive for, for, uh, in both senses, you know. For example, for those who, who love uh, ancient architecture, Whenever you go to, the, to see the, the Parthenon in, in the Acropolis in Athens, you have to see they was, has had three authors, <clears throat> an extraordinary uh, uh, client, Pericles. You see, but uh, the, the author was uh, uh, Ictino, was the architect, uh, Phidias was the sculptor, and Callicrates was the mathematician. Put uh, all uh, dimensions, orders, and all that is really extraordinary. You have to see, you see that in a certain point, in a, in a certain moment, architecture was really, the, uh, like I say before, like uh, today, you know, space science, or things like that, you know, they permit the man, you see, in the everyday, uh, 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 the everyday to, to find a connection to the cosmos. And you see, maybe if I permit me to say something, I built, I tried once in my life to do that. And it was in ground zero. I built uh, the path station. Now the path station has a gap. It's 80 meters wide. Now this gap opens. This gap opens. And the sun enters it. And it makes a way in the center of the hole. You, you understand? It's by case we could tilt it. Uh, you see, we, we calculate the angle and so and so. And tilt it a little bit. It doesn't fo follow the grid of Manhattan. You see? And it tilts it. and. You see, there is, uh, uh, in a certain point, you know, this strip of light enters and in a moment, exact moment, goes through the center. Now, it happens twice a year, the 29th of March and the 11th of September at 9.29, which it is the moment in which the second tower collapsed. So the building can embody in a silent way, you know, the memory of the fact, you know, and all those things can be architecture, you know, it's very important for me to open your mind more from your way, you know, of the exact science of the computer and so to see and from now on to read the buildings in another way, you see, or try to read them because, um, and it, may, it mesh with the question of ecology, architecture will remain always an artificial fact, a, a pure creation of the human spirit, but can learn a lot about nature. This is, in my opinion, the future goes very much in that direction. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.